Uh, good late afternoon from Abu Dhabi. I'm uh, John Defterius, uh, Emerging Markets Editor for CNN, and uh, welcome to our Scenarios for a Jobs Reset. It's uh, been a pleasure to co-develop this uh, session with the team from the World Economic Forum, directly linked to the release today of the Future of Jobs Report. Um, our objectives here for the next 45 minutes are uh, very straightforward, to, to assess where we've been in the 10 months since the start of the pandemic in most parts of the world, it started earlier in China, uh, explore the have and have not industries, if you will, technology and how it's exploded uh, since the need from work from home and the adjustments to office life as we see it today and traditional industries, particularly manufacturing, which has been dislocated because of the pandemic. We of course will delve into layoffs, uh, reskilling and rebuilding the workforce and certainly want to address gender inequality and the fallout for youth. Uh, we have a superb lineup for our uh, discussion uh, this afternoon. One of the co-chairs of the summit, a co-author of the jobs report, uh, the minister of startups uh, joining us from Algeria and a major industrial group from Turkey, which is across a number of different sectors, which makes it even more uh, relevant for the discussion today. Let me introduce them. Uh, first joining us from Algiers is Minister Yassin uh, Walid. He's the Minister of Startups. He is the youngest minister, in fact, uh, in North Africa at 26 years old and with a big task ahead to start up that uh, sector. Uh, Ebru Osmimar is the chairperson of the board for Limac Holding in Ankara. It's good to see her. Uh, Guy Ryder, Director General of the International Labor Organization out of Geneva and one of the co-chairs of this meeting. And Sadia Sahidi is the Managing Director of the World Economic Forum. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks there, uh, the co-author of the report today has put a lot of effort into getting the, the full comprehensive uh, view of the jobs market today, reskilling and then what's likely to happen uh, between now and 2025. Uh, we have four panelists, 45 minutes. We're taking questions on our platform as well. We'll try to get to those uh, when we can. Uh, after we kind of delve into the key issues I mentioned here. Uh, for those on social media, it's hashtag jobs reset. If you hear things that you like to uh, delve into, uh, to push it out onto social media. Uh, and we ask you to use the uh, at WEF or at WEF uh, handle uh, for Twitter at the same time. Uh, before we get the conversation going, we have a, a brief video that outlines the key elements of the report today. Let's take a look at that and I'll be right back with you for the discussion. COVID-19 is one of the biggest crises of our time. It has impacted every single one of us, shaken our social systems, and disrupted every sector of our economies. The automation of work combined with the global recession led workers to lose their jobs at an accelerated pace compared to previous years. And this trend is expected to continue. The ongoing shift in the division of labor between humans, machines, and algorithms might displace 85 million jobs worldwide in the next five years. While 97 million new roles, ones that are more adapted to this new task distribution, may emerge. By 2025, companies expect to displace roughly 6% of their total workforce. One in two workers will need reskilling. And those remaining in their current roles will need to update 40% of their skill set to adapt to the changing labor market. There is a way to collectively benefit from these challenging times. Decades of research have shown that the most valuable asset of any economy or company is its human capital. Around the globe, companies are already experiencing a shortage in relevant skills for future roles and are investing in reskilling and upskilling their workforce. By 2025, organizations say they will train over 70% of their employees to ensure they can smoothly transition into the jobs of tomorrow. These include DevOps engineers, artificial intelligence specialists, digital marketing managers, talent acquisition specialists, and customer success specialists. 
It will take on average between two weeks and five months for workers to pick up new skills, allowing them to move into these new roles. But data shows they won't need to have the perfect skill set to start transitioning. While two thirds of employers expect to get a return on investment in employees reskilling programs within just one year, governments will also need to step in to update and fund education and training systems and to ensure displaced workers have adequate safety nets. With purposeful leadership and collaboration, we can turn this global crisis into a unique opportunity to transition into a future of jobs that is inclusive, fair, and sustainable. That uh, laid out a number of the uh, challenges ahead and also the opportunities here. It's, it's interesting to see 85 million jobs displaced by 2025 and the ability for a creation of 97 million jobs. But uh, the transition is a painful one as we're feeling in 2020. Uh, the other point I think we should bring up during our discussion here is that uh, you know, global governments have stepped up, particularly in the developed world, to pump in about $12 trillion to the global economy, uh, which has certainly helped to, to lift us from the lows that we saw uh, in March, April, and May. Uh, but it raises the question, how long can countries continue to pump that much money into their systems, particularly those in the developing world, which are under strain? I'd like to start with uh, Guy Ryder, who's one of our co-chairs uh, at this Jobs uh, Reset Summit. And, and give us a sense, uh, Guy, how deep the wounds are, because uh, a lot of this has to do with the rollout of vaccines. We saw at the IMF World Bank meeting, uh, there was a, a push and money set aside to assist in the developing world to get the vaccines out there. H how deep is the dislocation from where we see it today vis-a-vis -vis where we were uh, four or five months ago? The dislocation, John, it's massive. Uh, we've estimated a loss of 495 million full-time job equivalents uh, by the middle of this year, a massive hit to income from labour down by over 10%. And that's why I think it's absolutely vital that we have this discussion about jobs, not after we've solved, that, we solved the health emergency, but right now, because we're going to have to build forward from a very, very dark place. And here's the worry, and you've put it there. Yes, some 11 trillion US dollars have been thrown at the economic and social consequences of this health emergency. But frankly, it's been country by country. There has been an absence, I think, of international common purpose in this effort. And that has, I think, to be put right. And the fact of the matter is, you know, COVID-19 comes on the top of a lot of transformational change that was already taking place in the world of work. Mm. Technology being the most obvious, but there are others as well. And here's the problem. I think COVID-19 has exposed extraordinarily, brutally, the inequalities, the precarities of people's situations in the world of work. And as we move forward towards this more digitalized future of work, I fear that those could be even more accentuated unless we build in, and this is mentioned in your introduction, issues of equity, issues of social protection, uh, issues of a social contract being renewed. And that hasn't been done up to now. So when I hear the word reset, I like it because I think it means that we're gonna have to approach many of the pre-existing challenges in quite a new way. Yeah, Guy, let me follow up with you quickly here then. Um, it's been disappointing that uh, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, the United Nations, have all suggested we need to move into this multilateral sense to make sure that the developing world doesn't live through this pain much longer than it needs to. But I don't see that collective effort. It's almost a struggle to set aside funds for the developing world where it's been a protection at home mentality. You'd agree with that? I would agree entirely with that, uh, John. That common purpose is not there. You know, and you see it in, in, in the funding of, of economic and social responses to the crisis. Now, we estimate that to bring up the low income uh, and, and developing country uh, effort to proportionally the same level uh, as that of the higher income countries would require um, $982 billion to be mobilized. Now that can be done, it can be done, but there seems to be little political intent to do it. And I think, unfortunately, when one tries to look after oneself in these circumstances, one's missing the point that we're not gonna get out of this unless we get out of it together. Thanks for that. Uh, Sadi, I'd like to talk to you about the double destruction. Uh, as Guy suggested here, 
we've gone through a period of automation already, right? That was a, a trend that was well underway. And then you've layered on uh, COVID-19 as, as a pandemic. Uh, over the next five years, 85 million jobs. It seems very difficult to make a shift and create nearly 100 million jobs at the same time. So I think um, these are actually somewhat conservative estimates in the sense that they're looking specifically at medium and large size companies across some of the largest um, advanced and emerging markets. I think the numbers could be much greater still in terms of both the disruption and the new opportunities. The critical factor here will be the decisions we make today for the next five years. As Guy just said, this is not something that we can afford um, to wait another year or two, wait for this health crisis to be over. This is the moment to make those investments. And there's a two different types of investments that I think in particular come out. There's one which, which Guy has already called out, which is the coordination that is missing in action, as was said yesterday at the summit, that is required at an international level. But then when it comes to the instruments that are currently being applied within countries that are dispersing funds towards workers, there needs to be more precision. There needs to be focus on the people that are hurting the most. There needs to be more conditionality built in so that it's not simply support for wages, but there is a game plan in place to reskill and upskill workers. And then third, this is the moment for investing in the markets and jobs of tomorrow. This is the moment to start building out the investments that we need for those 97 million new jobs to come through. Now, that's just the, the views of the heads of HR and heads of strategy that are responding to us. But there's much more to be done that can be part of government incentives for creating that better future. I think it's important for us to cover the gender inequality and why this burden is landing uh, so hard on women, uh, particularly in the developing world, uh, Sadia. So in most societies, I think similar to the trend that you talked about in terms of automation, in most societies, it's um, been decades that um, even though women are in the workforce in much larger numbers than ever before, in both advanced and emerging markets, they happen to be the ones that take on most of the burden of care responsibilities. And now they have a double-double shift. Um, and that is essentially that they are not only having to take on much more pressures in the workplace, especially the women that are amongst the frontline and essential workers in many societies, but in addition to that, they have a double shift in the home, which um, comes in the form of caregiving for elder care, child care, especially with school closures. And so that is what's causing additional stress for women in particular and potentially starting to create a disincentive to return to the workforce. And that, frankly, would end up um, uh, reversing all of the gains that have happened in recent decades. Um, and as, as, uh, one, uh, as the UN Women has pointed out, could create a situation where the office becomes a place for men to return to and not for women. Thanks very much, Sadia, for the uh, follow-up on that. I'd like to bring in Minister uh, Walid, uh, joining us from uh, Algeria. Uh, as the Minister of Startups, uh, and you're part of this uh, younger generation at 26, it seems like a heck of a task to try to develop startups in, in a period of time where there is so much strain. You can look at it, turning it upside down and say, well, this is ph phenomenal. We can support the entrepreneurs uh, of the Middle East and North Africa at the same time. What are you finding in the first 10 months of the pandemic, uh, Minister? Um, it is a fact that um, the world economy is experiencing a time of uh, uncertainty. Uh, locally in Algeria, the situation seems to be uh, under control now with uh, less than um, 200 uh, new cases daily and things are getting back to normal slowly. Um, but still the coronavirus pandemic has uh, uh, ravaged most of the, the world economy and Algeria, much as the rest of the world, um, have been reducing startups creation um, uh, we we also noticed that um, um, it have the, the, the COVID-19 have been challenging their, their survival and uh, and limiting their, their growth. Uh, of course, this is not exclusive to startups only. We we have also uh, noticed that business application have been um, uh, dropping uh, significantly in recent uh, months. And, and there have been a uh, way, um, but during the, this crisis, this crisis, um, the startups have 
have um, continued to play a critical role for, for our economy. Um, some uh, innovative um, uh, new, uh, new startups uh, have reacted fast and, uh, and flexibly to the pandemic uh, and have been very helpful in, in shifting towards uh, a fully digital uh, education, health uh, services. Uh, some of them also provided uh, innovation in, in medical goods or, or in services. Uh, so they have shown how uh, they, the, the, the way they, they are particularly good at, at uh, adapting uh, and, and they have demonstrated how, how effective they, they can turn COVID-19 uh, solution into uh, viable uh, businesses. Um, for example, e-commerce here uh, experienced a positive rebound uh, in most sectors. Mm -hmm. Due, due to the fact that um, uh, the, the people could not go to physical stores during the, the, the lockdown. And so uh, here, as well as uh, I think the, the, all the uh, North Africa region startups have uh, uh, emerged as a, a key uh, drivers for, for economic growth and job creation, uh, maybe in the um, post uh, COVID-19 scenario. Great. Thank you very much, Minister. We had you, uh, your line waffle a little bit there, but we could get all your thoughts. Uh, and I appreciate it. I didn't realize also your portfolio is, is wider than I even expected with micro enterprises, of course, covering uh, startups, but the, also the knowledge economy, which we'll circle back with on, on the youth discussion as well. Uh, Ebru Ozemir of uh, Lima Holdings. This is interesting to have you on the panel because it's tourism, construction, energy, cement. You have a mixture of many things under the conglomerate. Uh, can you give us the sense, and you raise a very interesting point about construction, uh, the knowledge economy hasn't reached into that sector fast enough. What do you think can be done specifically in construction here to adapt workers to the, the next generation of technology, uh, AI, 3D printing in that space? Uh, hello, thank you very much. And hello and all the best from Turkey. Uh, yes, as you have suggested and said, uh, Turkey, the construction industry, I think it's the less digitalized and the less automotive. And we have seen the effects during the pandemic. And we realized that we were expecting a digitalization, robotics, automation. However, just in the mid mid beginning of the pandemic, we realized that we have to do much faster because we're active in 15 different countries. And we had like more than 50,000 workers, blue colors, white colors and service people and we realize that we can't even reach the country so you have to really be digital to be able to reach second is uh, problems regarding the supply chain you know we had to send equipment uh, people to the countries we had issues say site safety i mean suddenly you were you're very much afraid of our workers health status in different countries with different health systems and workforce safety issues and challenges due to low or poor digitalizations, we had to really focus on that side. When we realized that we have to reskill and upgrade the skills of the people that we are working with, and we really started the trainings that you have already mentioned in the video. And the other idea is, you know what, as especially which was just published, the IMF report, it says that the countries, if they invest 1% of their GDP in construction, or in the PPPs and all kinds of infrastructure investments, they will grow by 2.7% their GDP. And the workforce they would create directly 7 million and indirectly it can go up to 20 to 30 million, including the micro effects. So realizing this, if we said that if we are in the least developed or least digitalized uh, or least automotive sector like construction, then we can, if it's reskill the workers, we had the blue work, blue colors or the white colors, we can help the job market in that way. So we are now putting a lot of effort uh, in the digitalization and reskilling of our workers right now. Good. Just very quickly on a follow up, if I may, uh, Ebru, uh, in that video is saying that uh, the, of the companies surveyed by the World Economic Forum, that 70 percent of their workforce will need to be upskilled. Is that about right? for your group of uh, LIMAC? We have to, I mean, uh, this is the aim that we have to do exactly. I mean, right now we are working with more robots. So we need people to do the robot, to, to work on the robots or the 3D printing that we can really print like, you know, low income houses. And for example, our target right now is the Africa. 
where the population is growing enormously. I mean, you know, which means more airports, more hotel, hotels, more schools, more housing. So 3D printing in the cheapest cost will help us to do that. But to do this, we need more mechanical engineers, more technical people who would be able to use these equipment. So this is the reason, I mean, 70%, I think is a very good, good number to reflect that. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Guy Ryder, uh, let's uh, get to the informal sector. We often think of the kind of formal job destruction where you can measure it, but this is uh, something that's much more difficult to measure and that's the informal sector, particularly uh, in the global south, if you will, Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia. Uh, what's your uh, early indications on this? Yeah, I think the first thing to remember is that six out of 10 workers in the world work in the informal economy uh, with everything that implies in terms of lack of protections. And in the early months of the pandemic already, we estimate that uh, 1.6 billion workers took a 60% hit uh, on their income, which was already pretty near the edge of poverty. So this is where an economic and social crisis tips over into a humanitarian crisis. And the message is, well, we've got to help these people through so they're not faced with the impossible choice of going out to work uh, in, in dangerous conditions or not being able to feed their family. And this is one of the you know, ways that this um, pandemic has uh, brought to the surface you know, these gaping inequalities and precarities uh, in the world of work. The majority of workers in the world simply have no social protection whatsoever. We've known this, we've lived with this, we've tolerated it. We simply haven't put this right. And, and now is the moment to do that as part of the reset. Um, and you know, we're gonna have to invest in a lot of things. I've already heard you know, excellent cases being made for investing in infrastructure, in health, in education, in care, uh, in the green economy. Uh, we've got to invest in social protection as well. And I say all of this knowing, as the IMF tell us, that the world is, you know, heading towards higher levels of public debt, up 20 percentage points uh, compared to GDP for the rich countries. You know, we have to ask ourselves, you know, are governments going to step up? Are we going to be able to mobilize the funding to make these necessary transitions in the reset actually happen? Good. I'd like to get your thoughts, Guy, on this and then Sadia as well. You know, if we pumped uh, 11 to $12 trillion into the global economy to kind of reinflate growth during this crisis, can you redirect the next wave of stimulus to do exactly what you're suggesting to make it more targeted to the informal sector, to the youth, uh, to women who have been locked out of the workforce guy? And then Sadia, I'd like to get your comments as well, please. Yeah, and I take on board what Sadia already said uh, about how to apply stimulus. I'm worried that this debate is now becoming a sort of a binary debate. You know, those who are saying, look, we can't keep these furloughs, we can't keep these systems going much longer. It's time to put the zombies uh, out of their misery uh, and move on to the future. But, you know, the point I would make, John, is, you know, put it in cinematographical terms, there's a big, big distance between the land of the living dead and the brave new digital world that we want to get to. And here, we really have to work together intelligently with these issues of equity and inclusion very much in our minds to get where we need to be, uh, where we need to be. I don't see that happening yet. I don't see the political focus on these issues, but it is perfectly possible and it needs to be done. Uh, Sadia, I was going to ask you to follow up and we have a question from our audience as well and it's combined the two. Uh, is there a need for a more social push to make companies invest more? That sounds impossible, but uh, drastic times require drastic measures. Uh, so we can funnel this in the right direction and the pickup mm. of the conversation with Guy. Go ahead, Sadia. Yeah. Um, first, let me pick up on that earlier point. It has to be both. We do have to provide support, social protection, safety nets to uh, workers in today's jobs, even if there is a very clear sense that um, these are industries that are on the decline, even if these are roles that will be redundant later, there has to be that support. There is no other way. Otherwise, we're looking at a social crisis that we will not be able to come out of. And at the same time, there does have to be that investment in the reskilling, in the upskilling, in the training that's required, in the investments into um, the jobs and markets of tomorrow. So it will have to be both. And I think that's where this is a moment of reckoning for a global leadership. Now, to your question on um, can companies do more? 
So one um, element that I think was very interesting coming out of the report, two out of three companies find that there is a dollar return on investment from reskilling and upskilling within one year, right? So this is not about a hypothetical case. This is about an actual return on investment that they can tangibly see on their balance sheets. So there is a business case to be made for most firms to do much more in terms of reskilling and upskilling. The problem right now is that they're taking generally very short-term decisions because of the economic downturn. They're doing this in, very, in mm. most cases is based on you know, quarterly results and not because they will get that return on investment. So that's one element that has to change, a reminder of um, stakeholder capitalism, why it matters. The second element is governments here can provide better incentives. So it doesn't have to be support schemes that don't take into account what happens next to the worker. There can be incentives and conditionalities built in that require companies to provide more support. And third, now this will not be the solution for the broad blue collar workforce. This will not be the solution for informal workers, but where the solution exists, we do have to provide it. And that is online learning and retraining. What we found is that already workers themselves have noticed what this current moment requires. There's been a fourfold increase in workers taking their own initiative for online learning and retraining. We saw a ninefold increase from governments wanting to offer those programs and a fivefold increase on the part of employers to use online learning and retraining. So let's use the solutions that we do have. Great. Let's bring in uh, Minister Walid again from uh, uh, Algiers. Uh, Minister, do you find it as a trend within Algeria where companies are saying, I need the government to do more and your budgets are under strain. You're a, a major oil and gas producer, particularly uh, the latter and prices have been low. So is it realistic to think that countries like Algeria, the governments can't step up any more than they're doing right now to address the jobs crisis that we're in? Um, maybe I'm going to, I'm going to talk about my my sector. Uh, in Algeria, uh, startups are quickly becoming a, a, a top priority. Um, we have uh, introduced recently a new public fund for startups, uh, tax exemptions, and more uh, more flexible regulatory framework. And we strongly believe that the uh, startups innovative model is the key to uh, contend with uh, unemployment uh, in the post ninety uh, in the post COVID ninety scenario. Um, we are also uh, gradually shifting in, into an entirely online uh, company registration process. Uh, I think COVID-19 have uh, changed forever our conception of entrepreneurship and, and work. Mm. And um, uh, the, the, this is very important for us because uh, in Algeria, as you know, uh, the, the, um, the economy, as you said, is uh, mostly based on uh, oil and gas. But um, paradoxically, we have also um, a very innovative uh, youth and uh, uh, startups are, as I said, becoming a um, um, uh, very important uh, priority for, for, for um, the, uh, the, the government. Um, and speaking about the, um, uh, the employment, uh, the employment rates for uh, two, 2019 were uh, 11 uh, percent, uh, with a, um, a general declining trend uh, since uh, many uh, many years, and so ha they have been some uh, maybe alarming projection that the, the severe uh, social distancing measures have been uh, uh, were made in, in July and uh, the, the is, is uh, I think, no uh, be behind us. Uh, so we hope that uh, be, by the end of the year, the, the employment rate will, will, won't decline too much. And um, the, as I said, that the, yeah. the very big uh, things are, 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 are um, slowly uh, moving back to, to normal with uh, with uh, COVID-19 cases, uh, new cases, uh, less than than 200. Uh, I think we we are we have been doing a pretty good job at uh, at um, uh, social distancing and uh, at uh, controlling the the, the COVID-19 spread. Uh, so the the actual government program is is going. Uh, at a very normal speed, 
since uh, since July. Okay, very good. Uh, Mr. I just need you to shorten your answers a little bit because the line is not that great. So it's kind of straining your system. So I'll come back to you in just a little bit. Hey, Brew, I wanted to get uh, another question from the, uh, the audience uh, watching today. And that is, how open is the construction industry and you own tourism properties as well? How open is the workforce that you're dealing with to reskilling? Uh, do they have the, the education skills to leap in and be reskilled in the time frame that the World Economic Forum suggested in the report? Um, currently, we have our, our, our work staff is like 90% Turkish, and also they're young because in the construction and the tourism industry, we have very young population of men and women, and they're really open to risk killing because they read and they're like always on the social media, so, so they see where this, the market is going. So the, actually, uh, the demand is coming from the workers as well to be reskilled, or we get a lot of uh, information from them to, to show us how they do it better. Because when we locked up, we had to work in isolated construction areas during the lockdown. So we, but we basically did this. We closed down and isolated the whole construction sites, wherever we are, in Kuwait, in Saudi, in Turkey, and we didn't leave them out for two, four months. So this is the reason it was not an easy way to work, but this was the only way to really protect them. And they understood it very well. And a lot of way of new uh, ways of doing business or new techniques, because oh, we were mostly in the engineering, they come to us. The hotels were closed at that time. We reopened it. And after the reopening, we re still received a lot of options or a lot of suggestions from them as well. You know, for example, to give you an idea, to give you an idea, we have built like 500 megawatts hydropower plant. Normally, we are supposed to do the commissioning by bringing like 10 engineers who are super talented or super experienced in that field. However, because of the lockdown, we couldn't. We only found one. However, the whole commissioning of these crazy big, you know, generators, we did this online. I mean, normally at normal conditions, nobody in the company would take that risk. But we were very successful and we even completed the whole commissioning process earlier than we envisaged. So, mm. you know, and I'm thankful to everyone who worked out there. So I think that we will be more effective. And the thing is the pressure is gonna come from the workforce. Okay, thanks very much uh, for the uh, answer there, Ebru. I think we need to hone in here if we can on the youth. I've seen surveys that are suggesting, you know, uh, college graduates or those coming out of technical uh, college will see their wages offered 10 to 20% lower and it's you lose a decade of earnings, if you will, uh, Sadia. What are you finding in the, the feedback from your uh, surveys here? How much of a setback is it for the youth as a result of the pandemic? Does it last a decade or longer? Yeah, I think there's a there's a mixed picture. I can certainly share what we have in the report, but I think um, we also have to take into account that the report is offering the view of medium and large size companies in large advanced and emerging markets. And that gives you a very specific picture. And those companies are um, to some extent um, creating a disadvantage for youth because they're going for keeping more of their experienced workers. Now, that's not necessarily to say that there aren't older workers who are at the same time across other sectors of the economy and other types of firms losing their roles and actually finding it very hard to, to find the necessary reskilling and upskilling to be able to jump back into the job market. So I think there's a nuanced picture we certainly find from the companies that we were able to get data from that it's the youth that are at a disadvantage and it's slightly more experienced and older workers that are actually able to retain more of their roles. That's interesting. Does that surprise you, in fact, that the older uh, members with experience can retain the roles? So it plays to my point that the youth is going to pay a disproportionate price for this, uh, Sadia. Yeah, I mean, again, I think this is because companies are in general under the economic stresses that they're under having to take very short-term decisions 
when they are laying off workers or downsizing certain um, parts of their businesses, they're keeping specific workers who do have a little bit more of that experience and not necessarily some of their broader workforce. And again, that is a pattern from specific sectors. Now it depends, that's the average. When you look at the healthcare sector, actually there's, um, all, there's almost none of the healthcare firms that are responding to us that they're saying that they're planning to do any layoffs. Very different when you look at agriculture, very different when you look at financial services, et cetera. So we were able to build a sectoral outlook, but on average, yes, this is slightly more disadvantageous for youth. Um, it is surprising to some extent um, because youth are at the same time, one would think, ready to upskill, reskill and move into new roles. But again, I think mm. it's because not enough companies are making that kind of investment. That said, when you look at the broader outlook, when you look at the broader numbers, it depends very much on the type of industry and type of country. Okay, another question that we've had come in uh, from our platform here, uh, Guy Ryder. We're starting to see governments uh, trim back wage supports, and it's been a huge debate on Capitol Hill, as we know, with the uh, $2.2 to $2 trillion package, the U.S. Senate wanted something lower. But the difference for the average American, for example, just using that as the largest economy in the world, is $300 a week versus $600 or even more. Is there a, is there a risk here you pull back and you really cause a shock when those subsidies are, are pulled out for the uh, average American or anywhere else in the world? Yes, I think we've got um, sort of two reactions from governments. We've seen the US one, uh, which contrasts with the European one. So, so Europe has tried to uh, retain people in their employment, um, keep them connected uh, to their companies. And the US position has been, well, just put money into social security. But either way, and there's merits to both of the, uh, the paths followed, we're at a situation now that if governments do pull back, either because resources are becoming limited or because they think it's time to move people along, I think we can expect a, a quite a violent spike in open unemployment uh, in the weeks and months ahead. And that is a, a really uh, very dangerous situation. It's what I was saying earlier on, you know, getting from where we are now to where we want to be, uh, it's a long and difficult transition. And, and I would beware of just letting people go now, having, you know, hitting the cliff, as it were. And, uh, would you allow me, John, just to say a word about young people as well? You know, there are four hits to young people. One, they never recovered from the 2008 crisis. Secondly, education and training has been massively disrupted. Thirdly, young people have been ejected from their existing jobs when they had them on a more than proportionate level to other workers, one in six young people. And fourthly, there's just no way into labor markets right now. And uh, all of the survey work we've done has shown not only that this is affecting their mental well-being, their views of the future, these people are becoming disaffected with public institutions and policymakers as well. Yeah, it, it raises another question that came in uh, from our audience today. How do you redefine the social contract uh, between government, industry, and the population? Uh, Mr. Walid, do you want to, to, to pick up here? In a developing market, how do you define the social contract post COVID-19. I don't know if you, ha you hear me because I think I have some technical um, issues. Um, the the uh, things are, are, are a little bit uh, complicated here in Nigeria because uh, due to the political situation uh, last year, uh, we, we have um, very many expectations from the uh, society and um, many people here in Nigeria are waiting for the government to have a, a more um, uh, sustainable uh, economy uh, because, as you know, oil and, and gas have been uh, dominating the, the, uh, the national economy for, for years. So uh, things are pretty complicated here, but uh, the most important thing is that uh, there, there have been some positive uh, impacts uh, from the COVID-19 uh, because um, we, we, we have uh, really been uh, amazed by, by what uh, young people have been doing to help the, the, the government to uh, um, find innovative ways, way, uh, ways to uh, maybe control the, the spread of the coronavirus. Algeria is uh, the country that uh, did uh, maybe the best job uh, in the region uh, when it comes to uh, 
uh, controlling uh, coronavirus uh, spread and uh, we are rebuilding our economy uh, and things I, I think are, are, have been uh, uh, pretty exceptional here. Um, but uh, as, you, as, you, as you mentioned earlier, uh, it, it is not easy uh, to maybe face the social uh, pressure when when you have when you are in, in, in a situation where you have to rebuild an economy and to uh, fight uh, a pandemic that is uh, this uh, this hard and, and this uh, uh, unique uh, in uh, our era. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, a, a question, uh, Sadia, for you: uh, Do you think this idea of offshoring because of the pandemic is just gone? Uh, it's a question that came in. Do you see the shift from the developed to the developing in an effort to try to save money, uh, help the developing world? But I think that would be kind of a political suicide for any company that uh, embarks on that at this stage. What do you think? I'd, I'd sort of take the flip side of that question. I think um, for most economies, they have to rethink their development model. They no longer um, can be competing on the basis of cheap, unskilled labor. They need to think very differently and very seriously about the kinds of human capital investments they make, because in the future economy, whether it arrives in two years or whether it arrives in five years, it will be critical that people have the skills that they need to be able to uh, contribute to their economy's growth, to be able to make a more sustainable planet, to be able to have more inclusive societies. There is no other way out. So I'd, I'd take the sort of the flip side of that question. I think that's how governments will have to think about their future growth. Good. And Ibru, how do you build a more resilient labor force in your company, uh, but in the context of Turkey, which has been a fast growing market, nearly 80 million consumers? What's the next steps to make it a more resilient labor market so you don't go through these crazy ups and downs because of the pandemic? You know, in Turkey, in the work that we do, and we're active in 14 different countries, we do export also a lot of people or staff to the countries that we work. So basically, the way that we work has been changing, especially in the construction sector, where we are becoming more, as you suggested, uh, more, more uh, I would say, automatic, more, we use more robots, we are more digitalized. So we need people who are more skillful in these aspects. So I cannot be able to send just like a blue collar person who can just do a regular work. This is the reason we started to equip our person our personnel here in Turkey, which will be more resilient, more skillful to do the jobs in a more higher, I would say, quality. So this is very important because Turkish construction sector is actually now a world brand. And the Turkish construction sector is resilient because we have people, staff at every level, at engineer level, technical level, blue collar level. For this reason, now we see we are more digitalized, although we were the least digitalized before. We need more people who are more skillful. So this is the reason we are really putting a lot of trainings right now to make them skillful before we send. And currently the lockdowns are still in power. So to most of these countries, they don't accept our workers yet. So this causes some um, you know, workforce mm. levels decrease. But this is the aim. Right now, we are using this time to be more, to create more skillful workers or engineers. Uh, Sadia, we went from kind of zero to 100 kilometers an hour when it comes to e-learning. We've been talking about it for the last two decades. I think in retrospect, people would say we were slow off the mark because it was a shock to the education systems, uh, east, west, north, and south. Uh, what do we need to do now to advance e-learning to reskill our workforces? Does the priority need to change with the, that investment as well? So one element that has become very clear is a, a what we need is a sort of universal adapter. We need a common skills taxonomy that is recognized by the learning platforms, by employers, by governments, and that allows for much more rapid training and reskilling. And we move away from a system that relies only on degrees and diplomas, but actually starts recognizing some of this learning as learning that should be valued in the labor market. That's actually an element we're gonna to try to um, start building a coalition around and launch tomorrow. So that's one critical point. And, and John, while, while I can, maybe let me just add one other element because the social contract question came up. 
Um, and I think um, you've, you've heard this from Guy as well, but one critical element of that will have to be a social protection floor, establishing that, establishing mm -hmm. funds around that, and ensuring that that becomes not a hypothetical, not something that we've been talking about for decades, but really something that is now taken seriously, because that is a fracture that has been exposed across all societies due to the pandemic and what's happened today. Okay, I'll ask our co-chair then, uh, Guy Ryder, to give us the final thoughts in a minute. Uh, I talked about the social contract. How about the safety net then, Guy? Because it, it get worse before it gets better because of the lack of stimulus probably in 2021. What's your final thought? Yeah, I, I tend not to talk about a social safety net. Uh, it, it's not the phraseology which I think captures the need very well. Social protection should be a right, but it is certainly the most effective lubricant of transition and change uh, that, that we can bring about. If you're asking people to retrain and upskill to move from where they are to where they need to be in the future, you do need to assist with this social protection process. Can I also say on education and training whilst subscribing to what's just been said, uh, I think also we need to understand that connectivity around the world is very different if we're going to rely heavily on technological uh, uh, mediation of, of education, we have to worry about the digital divide. And we should also recognize, I think, and the experience of COVID-19 has highlighted it very, very clearly that by and large, education cannot be a do-it-yourself activity. You know, the teaching mm -hmm. profession, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the helping people along and orient them is really important if we're gonna make this work. Okay, thank you very much. What an excellent panel. I appreciate our audience sending so many questions. We tried to address as many as we could in our uh, 45 minutes, but I think we did so effectively. Uh, Minister Yassine Walid from uh, Algeria, it's a pleasure to, to meet you. I wish you the best of luck in the portfolio. Bru Osmamir, the chairperson of the Board for Limac Holding, thanks for the comprehensive look at the construction sector and tourism and the work you're doing. Our co-chair Guy Ryder from the ILO and uh, Sadia Sahidi, who is the co-author of the report and a managing director from the World Economic Forum. Really superb interventions today and also for the questions from the field. Uh, my thanks.